It is a brand new week of Village Vice, and we're going to help you get through whatever you're going through. Like if you're having a good week or a bad week or whatever, we're going to help you get through it. He's we're Zach here. Blackerby. I'm Brad Law. Thanks for watching. Uh, Zach, a busy week. It was so busy last week that we didn't even get to talk about the 2025 schedule. So before we do any basketball like decompressing, Okay. We, we got to talk 2025 schedule for the Auburn Tigers. They're going to log a lot of miles in 2025, and the SEC is still jockeying for positioning with its media partners two years away. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think the way the 2025 opponents shake out is a good thing for Auburn. I, I think the way it seems like internally – the belief is Auburn can make a push in 2025 for the expanded college football playoff. And, and I think with their slate of like, we know who they're going to play mm -hmm. and where they're going to play. We just don't know when they're going to play within the 2025 season. But I think your road games are manageable. I think your home games are tough, but you get them at home. Mm -hmm. And I think Auburn's roster is kind of set up to be better in 2025 than it is in 2024. I think there's a lot to like about the the immediate future, I guess, the, you know, two years out of for the Auburn Tigers. I love Alabama and Georgia at home in year three with this staff and with three years yeah. of recruiting and roster implementation under their belt. I, I like that. That's your first like realistic opportunity to kind of swing and, and knock guys down and not have to do it with a sling and a rock. Mm -hmm. Like it's not necessarily David and Goliath by the time you get to that point. And I do like that. I think it's interesting that it's the 2024 schedule, but in reverse. Yeah. It's what do you think about that? Yeah. So all the teams that Auburn's playing at home this year, they're playing on the road next year and vice versa where they're traveling to the Missouri's, the, the Kentucky's, you know, they're, they're hosting them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a lazy move by the sec or do you say, okay, you know what? This plan is to play everybody everywhere over the yeah. span of four years. So it, it doesn't really matter how they achieve it. Are you okay with the way the sec did this? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, doesn't yeah. matter if I'm okay with it or not. I guess there, it, it is the way that it is. Oh, it I matters. I yeah. care. <laughs> I care sure how not. you feel about it. That's why I asked. Yeah, I understand. Well, no, I mean, to the people at the SEC office, to the schedule makers, you know, no matter what I think or not. You don't not. think they watch Village Vice? Yes, but I don't think they take it into consideration. They should. Okay. All right. They absolutely should. All right. It's like the old, you know, the the opinions of the hosts are not necessarily those of the staff and management of the SEC, but they should be. Um yeah, I think it's under the guise of you play everybody every four years, so it doesn't matter anyway. Now, for that to, you know, if, if you project that forward, it means that in 26, the teams that come off the schedule, right, are uh, Arkansas, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Vandy. And so you'd put back on the schedule in 26, LSU, Florida, Tennessee, Texas, um, who am I missing? South Carolina, South Carolina, yeah, um, Mississippi State, Ole Miss. Like some of those would would jump back on, and you take everybody off that's not Alabama, Georgia. Yeah. So, which means it's going to get tougher. Assuming you know the yeah. powers stay where they currently are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Schedule gets tougher in the future if that's the case. Your home games in twenty five become your non conference games: Ball State, South Alabama, and one other, I guess, still to be named, and then Kentucky, Missouri. Alabama and Georgia. Yeah. It's not the highest value home schedule for the price of a season ticket, but mm -hmm. it, it does give you a manageable, much more manageable home schedule. You're also on the road at Baylor in 2025 right. to start the season. So you're logging a ton of miles that year, going to Baylor, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Vandy. Vandy's your short game. Vandy's your driving game. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a, a big flight across multiple states. Toughest road game in 2025 right now is at Oklahoma. Is it Texas A&M? Is it Baylor? Uh, Oklahoma. I will say Oklahoma. I think I agree with you. I think I, I agree with you. It seems like they're going to be in a situation where they want to like change out quarterbacks every year. So we'll see mm -hmm. what happens with that. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. All right, so that's the 2025 schedule. You want to tell the people about our friends at mybookie.ag? Well, it's where you need to be betting on all of your uh, NCAA tournament action. Mybookie.ag, all of our brackets are gone. 
Because yep. let's just be honest, all of us had Auburn at least go into the Sweet 16. Yep. At least the Sweet 16. The beautiful thing about mybookie.ag is it doesn't matter where you are, Brad. Yeah. But you can bet on every single game. There's a million different props as well. And look, MLB opening day is Thursday. You want yep. to go into the, the MLB season. You want to go into the, sweet, the round of Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. Ready to rock and roll. So what you need to do, head over to mybookie.ag. Use promo code next round. You'll hear this sound, Brad. Bloop. You'll hear it. It's, that's money hitting Bloop. your account. Free money for you to play with. Bloop. Mybookie.ag is promo code next round. You will have a blast. A blast doing it. I love it. Uh, mybookie.ag. By the way, I'll tell you, um, here's something you can cash out on or cash in on. Alabama's going to the final four. We all know that, right? You understand oh, that the way this is where the, we're at now. Okay. The, Got the it. way the way the tournament has played out to this point, they're going to the final. Of course they are. Because of course they are. So um that's you know, congratulations to them in advance for their first ever final. Do four. you really have them beating North Carolina? Yep, sure do. I don't think but, I do. I've seen this movie before. I've seen this play out. I've uh, I've just seen it, and so I know what's coming. Got it. Yep. Hope you're wrong. Yeah. No, Hope I do too. Wrong. I do too, clearly. Yeah. Um, even though there's some people that I really like that are involved with their program, it'd be a great memory for them. But um, I'd kind of like to hold on to that final, the only final four appearance a little longer. Oh, I get it. That's really the only thing we're holding on to right now. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm with you. I'd like to hold on to it too, but we'll right. see. We'll so, see. let's talk about this. So, Auburn gets bounced by Yale oh, and it is unquestionably. Okay disappointing and it's disappointing because it's so shocking because yeah. uh, you know despite the fact that there have been 32 other one through four seeds in the last 10 years that have been bounced in their very first game in the NCAA tournament it is still like when March happens to you it is shocking and it like your immediate response just like when you're injured you immediately have this rush to response and it's anger and it's sadness and it's I can't believe it. You're in shock. Mm -hmm. And that is what happened to to Auburn fans Friday. Yeah, and you and I recorded a show. It didn't get posted until like the game had started. But yeah. you and I were very confident. You and I were very yeah. confident. And, and I've talked to so many folks, whether it was at church or just people hanging out in the neighborhood. It's like, you know, I, I was worried about this game. I saw it coming. I'm like, I, I did not. I, didn't I did either. not see this coming. And, you know, the whole narrative of, it was a bad, a poorly called game, which I agree. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think the officiating was even, but it, it shouldn't matter. Like, it shouldn't matter. Auburn is so much better than Yale. Yep. But it doesn't matter. That's March. Then that's the madness. And, you know, you, you lost one of your best players, maybe your third best player on the roster, depending on the night, maybe even better than that. You lose him three or four minutes into the game. Like, that stinks. But also, like, we talked all season about how deep Auburn was and, like, the yep. depth had a thing. And, like, people are forgetting, like, Auburn was up. 10, you know, with, you know, eight minutes halfway, to go, eight minutes to go. Yeah. Second halfway over halfway through the second half. And it's, I mean, they choked like it, it stinks, but that's, that's what happened. Auburn was in a prime situation yeah. when Denver Jones made that three it felt like the dagger. It yep. felt like Auburn was about to run away with it. It didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. And, and, uh, and props, uh, props to Yale. Yeah. Um, who then promptly got run out of the gym against San Diego state because, of course they did. I mean, it's a five against a 13. So that's more often than not going to, to happen. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I've heard a lot of things that just, I guess when you put them together, they're too much to overcome, but none of them feel like they should be. And there's and here's kind of my point about the game and the situation is that all of these multiple things can be true at the same time. Um, is it true that Chad Baker Mazzara was... Um, incited? Was it that he was retaliating rather than instigating? Yeah, I think that's true. It is also true uh, that you have to know better than to retaliate. You have to know better. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think him elbowing, I mean, that's, it's I mean, that was a, it was a pretty selfish thing to do. I mean, even his teammates were kind of saying like, yeah, you don't win championships doing yep. that. It's, it was very, very selfish. It was very, very in the moment. It was very, yeah. very short-sighted. And then to go on Twitter afterwards from the locker room, I, I just, 
I love Chad Baker Mazzara. Yeah. I think he's been awesome. He's been so fun to watch and to yep. cheer for and to cover, but that wasn't good. Like that was yeah. not a good day for him. And it's okay to say that. It's yep. okay to say it was retaliatory and not instigating. And it's also okay to say really bad decision, really bad. And frankly, when you've made some of the decisions and gotten some of the flagrant calls that he's gotten over the last month, he has to be, he has to have a heightened awareness that that kind of thing, he's now, you know, uh, he's, he's a target for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you have to know better. Now, it's also fair to say, shouldn't matter. Shouldn't matter against Yale. We've talked all year about how deep the team is and how about how versatile they are. They and it didn't matter. Out. It didn't matter. That's not why Auburn lost. Auburn was up no. 10 points with eight minutes to go, like we just no. said. Um, they didn't lose because they were in Spokane. They didn't mm -hmm. lose because they lost Chad Baker Mazar a couple of minutes into the game. Um, part of the reason they lost, they turned the ball over too many times. A lot of empty possessions. And in the losses and the rare single digit win against Mississippi State, Auburn had double digit turnovers. That's a recipe. When you get when you strip everything else away, strip away location of the game, strip away um personnel, strip away all this other stuff. You turn the ball over that many times against a quality opponent who holds you to fewer possessions anyway. And oh, by the way, one of their game, one of their guys shoots lights out from three in one game in the NCAA tournament. All of, saying all of it together. That's what loses you a game like that. Yeah, but also like make your free throws make, at well, the end of the game. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just so many things where it's it's not like Auburn got whooped. I mean, in yeah. fact, down the stretch, there were several times where Auburn could have either held on to the lead or forced overtime. Yep. But this just didn't yeah, happen. It balanced in the worst possible way because early in the game, Auburn sure. made the free throws. Yale did not. Yale missed a lot of front end one and ones in the last six, seven minutes of the first half. Um, unfortunately, in the second half, that shifted and they made their free throws and Auburn did not. There was yeah, no. I missed the front end of a one and one, which yep. with a few minutes left to go. And then the one that, you know, is going to be under the microscope is you get gifted an opportunity yeah. down two. Trey Donaldson, an 80 plus percent free throw shooter on the season. Yep. And and I was watching with somebody, I'm like, he's not gonna make these. He's not gonna yeah. make these. And it's just, I mean, that kind of lines back up with Auburn's inability to consistently win close games mm -hmm. this past season. And I don't think he really had that dude who you wanted to give the basketball in those types of situations. I do think yeah. that'll change next year, whether it's yeah. the portal or you believe in Pettiford coming in. We'll see. But this team is going to look different next yeah. year, um, you know, especially from a depth standpoint. We said on the show that nobody saw that uh, it all it came down to point guard play. Auburn's point, and they didn't have to score twenty five and dish out fifteen assists, but they had to get Auburn into the offense, and they might have to make a clutch shot here or there. And man, it it just it just didn't happen. So, well, and like Aiden didn't score. Your star freshman yeah. didn't score. So, yeah. Fascinating to see what they do with that position this offseason. It really – no, and I, I think it's the most pivotal thing to watch in terms of – we know the roster will be totally rebuilt because it's – It's the going, second most important thing that he's going to have to do to the roster. Uh, replacing Janai being number one. Bring Janai back. You don't. Bring you Janai can't back. replace him. Bring him back. Ooh. Bring him you back. Think, you think there's a shot he comes back? If I had to guess right now, I would say – I think it's truly 50-50, Brad. Okay. If I had to guess right now, I think he comes back. Oh, that's interesting. That would excite. I'd be super excited about that. I'm seeing all these posts on Instagram from these Auburn pages saying, thank you, Janai. And I'm like, I, we don't know if he's done or not. Mm -hmm. We don't know if he's done or not. I think on to victory is going to make a very, yeah, very lucrative offer for Janai Broom to stay. That's just my gut feeling. Well, all right. That's interesting. That's, I can't wait to see that because then I think you're right. If there's any shots you keep him, that's, that's win number one in the off season. Yeah, forget the transfer portal. Bring Janai Broom back. That's the yeah. best transfer you can get right now. No question, no question. Yeah. But that, but basketball rosters will be will be over halfway or about halfway remade every single year anyway. That's yeah. basketball. So, you know, can you and can you make Denver Jones more of a focal point of the offense early in the year? I think I you can. That, yeah, I think you can. And then you know, Chad Baker Mazzara, I assume, is coming back. Mm -hmm. Cheney. 
You've got him coming back. They're going to have to replace the impact of Jalen Williams. I think that's that's a huge yeah. question. Um, and then like Chris Moore, you know, he'll be gone. Um, there's a lot of different opinions about Chris Moore, but like he played a lot of minutes this year. Like it's still you still got to replace those. But critical they, in the uh, FTC tournament run too, obviously. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, it's going to be a different looking team, especially if Jani Broom does go pro. Um, I don't think Dylan will be back. Just a hunch. Uh, I think Dylan will go test the waters and try some different things. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see. This is all just, you know, gut instinct. No inside information. End of season speculation, which is, which yeah. is fine. And it will change. It'll, it'll evolve and we'll have those conversations as it does. So it's kind of part of the, yeah, you can turn it into fun of the off season. Look, Auburn had, and this, this may be unpopular right now because we're still so close to, the end of the year. And none of this disqualifies you from being upset about the way that it ended. But folks, Auburn had a successful season by every measure, except the fact that it lost on the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. So it's true that Auburn lost on the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, but is that one factor like genuinely now in our heart of hearts outweigh an SEC tournament championship and Jalen Williams becoming the winningest player in program history and finishing second in the league when you were picked to finish sixth and selling out every home game and furthering the narrative that Neville Arena is the toughest to play in the SEC and one of the toughest in America. I just, I don't, I don't buy personally that one loss on the weekend and a missed opportunity at a second or third weekend in the NCAA tournament wipes out what you experienced over the last 30 games, four months of the calendar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest game, and you fell flat. Like, you hate that. Um, it's the biggest game because they lost. No, I don't think. I, no, it, it, it's, it would have been the biggest game if they had won it, too. I mean, it's the tournament. It's Until the, the next tournament. Game. Especially when you're kind of, you know, waving the flag of, we should have been better than a four seed. We shouldn't mm -hmm. have to travel and, and all of that. I, I do think, I do think we made this worse on ourselves than we probably could have. Um, by complaining so much about the seed, or and by, I, don't, I don't, I don't even want to say complaining, but okay. making a deal out of it. Yeah, you know, I, I think complaining has a negative connotation. I think, I think you know they were just fighting for their program, which is the right sure. thing to do, but. I do think there are kind of some things that come with that instead of just taking it. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. the selection committee clearly doesn't care about the SEC tournament. Good to know moving forward. And, and I think that's where Greg Sankey needs to step up and do something. But that's a that's a different conversation for a different day. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, no, the the tournament, your first tournament game up to that point is the biggest game of the year. I, yeah. that, that's what I believe. Up to that point, my point is if you'd won that game, it's no longer the biggest game. Of no, the, it'd be the second biggest game until your next one. Yeah. So you're kind of backed into a corner until you lose a game, and then now you've lost the most important game of the year unless you win the national championship because every next game is the most important game. Sure. So yeah. two years from now, when we look back to this season, is the game against Yale more important big picture than the win over Florida in the SEC tournament championship? Because you raise a banner for that, and you get a ring for that, and that's real, and that lasts. Yeah, And every team except one is going to lose their most important game of the year, which is their next game in the NCAA tournament. That is true. That is true. We, I, I think Auburn, I think it would do a lot for this program to get back to the Sweet 16. Like, I don't think that's a crazy thing I agree. to say. And, I agree. I mean, Auburn's been set up to where I think their path to Sweet 16s was pretty... Pretty straightforward. I mean, we talked about, yep. you know, the Jabari and Walker year where, where they were the two seed. Like, they should have, you know, they were better than that Miami team. They just fizzled out towards the end of the year. But, like, that was a team that should have been in the Sweet 16. Yep. This year, I think the path to the Sweet 16 was very favorable. Yeah. And, and and they weren't able to capitalize. And it stinks. And, look, nobody hates it more than these players and these coaches, but they fell short. They yeah. fell short on this stage. And, um They've got to figure out. They've got to figure out how to get kind of that that monkey off their back and say, okay, how can we consistently, or I guess just how can we get to the second yeah. weekend of the tournament again for the first time since 2019? Yep, I do think that matters. And I think there's a difference between a Sweet 16 team and a field of 64 or 68 team. And yes. doing it consistently is hard. Very few teams do it totally on a consistent basis. And which is why every time you do it, 
you have to fully appreciate it and not just stick it on the show. All right, got another one of those, put it on the shelf, moving on to the next. No, you celebrate thing. it 100%. Yeah, you got to celebrate so. tournament wins as a whole. Yeah. But I mean, I don't even think we're asking for it to happen consistently. It's just like, yeah. do it a second time. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's fair. I do think that's fair. I, again, I think both those things can be true at the same time. Like you can, in this season, not get there. But the same with an SEC tournament championship. Just because the selection committee doesn't value an SEC tournament championship doesn't mean that the fan who paid his or her money to go to Nashville and experience that or to follow this team wherever they went it throughout the season doesn't mean that it doesn't have to or that it can't mean something to you. You don't just take an SEC tournament championship, look at it, put it on the shelf, and then move on. You celebrate those too. And if that's all you have to celebrate, okay, at least you have that to celebrate. At least you have it to celebrate, right? Like you'd yeah. rather you'd rather have beaten Florida in the SEC tournament championship and lose in the first round versus lose to Florida and Bingo. lose in the first round. One hundred percent, because at least you've got a banner. At least you have yeah. a banner for in a ring for this team. So I, I agree with that. But at some point. At some point, you've got to you've got to get back to the Sweet Sixteen, and yeah. I think this was Auburn's easiest path in doing that since they went in 2019. Completely. So we'll agree with um that. we'll see we'll see what happens this off season, and we'll see how they reload. Had a better chance this year than even the Jabari and Walker team. In I, my I think so. Because yeah, I think walk. so. Yeah. yeah, I agree. All right. Something else we agree on is uh, this episode being brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. Uh, this season, make sure to groom your carpets and your drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out the winter bush with Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence. Well, it's going to bloom like those springtime flowers. Just embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this special offer. Go to manscaped.com, use our promo code VICE to get 20% off and free shipping. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look or, you know, below the waist or above the waist, you want to clean up that neckline a little bit, Manscaped has the right tools for the job. 20% off free shipping when you use the code VICE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping. Promo code VICE, manscaped.com. Manscaped, the very best in men's grooming. Hearing discussions uh, just coming out of Auburn football spring practice. I guess it sounded like a scrimmage, like a pseudo scrimmage this past Saturday. Um, sounds like Cam Coleman continues to just be different yeah. from all the other wide receivers. That that storyline, that narrative is not going to go away, Brad. It's, it's, it's not going away. And I cannot overeat on that storyline either. It's impossible. I'm giddy. I'm excited to see him at A-Day and um, and everything else in the receiving core. I'm excited to see at A-Day as well. But I think if you ask Auburn fans who's the guy who um, needs to live up to his potential, even in year one, and that's asking a lot of freshmen, but it's wide receivers. So relatively speaking, freshmen can do that and at the SEC level. Many have done it in the last decade. Um, it's Cam Coleman. So bring on every one of those reports. Yeah, and so then, like, who who follows in behind him? Because I've heard mixed reports about a lot of other folks in the wide receiver room. Mm -hmm. And it's early in spring, so there's plenty of time to clean things up because sometimes it's, you know, timing. Sometimes it's are you exactly where you need to be at that specific time Yeah. Uh, with, with routes and, you know, they're rotating quarterbacks and everybody's throwing to everybody. So there, there's a bunch of moving parts here. But who's going to be the guy that steps in behind Cam Coleman? Rivaldo Fairweather said he wants to double all of his stats from a season ago. Woo. Put that into an IV right into the bloodstream, baby. That, that That's all I'm saying. That would be incredible. That'd be great. You six, talk about like, yeah, six catches and 60 yards a game. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. Because then, like, what does that do for everybody else? I mean, that yeah. opens up the running game. It opens up the outside of the numbers, which is where Auburn historically just has not done well in the passing game. So uh, we'll see if he's able to do it. And he may be Auburn's number two option in the passing game. Like, that wouldn't shock me. Yeah, I don't know if it excites me, if that's the best case scenario. But, like, it wouldn't shock me if he was the number two option in the passing game. Well, he's so versatile, and if you can create, if your top two receivers are both matchup problems for the opponent, yeah, then great. And if those are your top two, if Cam Coleman and Rivaldo Fairweather become your top two, 
Well, now you're asking the third defender on the opposition. Big opportunity for a third guy, whether it's slot, running back, whatever, um, to, to be a matchup problem for somebody. And that's how you get leverage, and that's how you win possessions. Right, right. So size is not going to be a problem, which is no. good. It's a good thing. But still, youth and inexperience, that will be a thing in this receiver room. But I think there's going to be some really high moments, and there's going to be some moments where it's just like, gosh. Man, next year when he's like not a freshman, this is going to be really, really fun. But yeah. we just got to balance it. We got to balance expectations for sure. Media viewing window Tuesday of this week. So another chance to to see the team then. And I'm sure we'll have a, a fresh batch of opinions and observations and um, thoughts after that viewing window. Yep. But for the meantime, Brad, that about does it for today's show. It does. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Remember to comment down below. I'll read every one of them, and we appreciate it. Remember, until next time, everyone has vices. Make sure Village Vice is one of yours.